Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video. Today it's time to talk all about water effects. Let's get into it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vincey V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vincey V style. That's right, today we're gonna get wet and wild and we're gonna talk about adding water effects to bases. Now this is something I've covered in sort of individual basing videos before, but today I really just wanna talk about water effects as a whole the different ways that they are, the different products that are out there, the different ways you can use them, the strengths and weaknesses of each, and hopefully give you some ideas for your bases and your projects and your display models in the future. Let's start at the beginning. First things first, why are we even talking about this? Well, because water effects are pretty cool. Uh, let's be honest, they look neat, whether on an individual base or whether as part of a display plinth or something similar, it can often add a lot of environmental impact to your miniature. Uh, whether it's sort of slimy, dripping, gross pools on things like Skaven or Nurgle models or stuff like that, or whether it's beautiful, flowing, still pools in forest scenes uh, with elves and other similar creatures of the forest, the reality is having those cool, clear, shiny, water effects often just makes a model look neat. In general, water effects are really just clear resin. Now there are primarily, and I'm, I'm being a bit simplified here, but I don't want to make this overwhelming, there are primarily three different types of products you can use for this on the market for the primary sort of resin pour, as it were. The first and most common is a one part resin. This is usually something like still water uh, or something like that. This sort of, uh, this still water or this resin water is just one thing. You open it up, you pipette it out, you put it into your base or into your display, and you let it dry. That's more or less all there is to it, or at least theoretically. We'll talk about actual things you want to do later in the tips and tricks for usage section. The second uh, thing that you often run into is two-part water effects. Now, this is often uh, something like Magic Water, but there's a lot of other brands on the market. Two-part resin, uh, clear resin uh, epoxies, you have to mix equal parts of usually A and B. They chemically react uh, once they're mixed and slowly harden and become pretty rock solid while also being crystal clear. The third is actually something that has come into a lot of attention much more recently in our space, the miniature painting world, but has been around for quite a while in the jewelry making world, and that is uh, UV or light reactive resin. Uh, and so that is usually, again, a single part, but it specifically reacts and uh, to, to UV light, usually a little UV flashlight that you're going to utilize that will uh, then harden it quite quickly. Uh, and <clears throat> so those are sort of your three options. Let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of each. All right, strengths and weaknesses of these three products. First off, with the single uh, part resin, so still water and things like that, uh, they shrink a lot. What I mean by that is all water effects, when you pour them, they will fill to a certain amount, and then over time, as they dry, it will shrink down. And so often what you'll get is this sort of concave effect in your water. What this usually means is that you have to do multiple pours, pouring less and less and less each time so that the shrinkage is also commensurately reduced and you eventually get a nice flat area. Uh, other than that, this stuff's pretty simple. My recommendation for this is if you're doing like small puddles and pools on bases, this is actually your simple go-to easy product. Those are small, very flat, very thin pools that usually will pour in quite easily. You can just pipette it in and no drama, very simple to utilize uh, and uh, to make look good. Two-part resins are going to be much more useful if you're trying to do any kind of significant pour. Significant pour here means anything where you have more than a quarter inch of depth in the overall resin. So once you get more than a quarter inch or a half an inch, 
you start the the single part uh, resins will get pretty sketchy and the shrinkage will become actually highly problematic however when you're dealing with a, a two-part epoxy, you can often get a much better, larger pour. Just the nature of these chemicals is they're much more stable, they have a lower amount of shrinkage, and will generally fill the space uh, of whatever you're trying to fill a lot better. So if you're trying to do like a display piece or something similar like that, this can be a great choice. These do often take a long time to cure, though. Because they are two-part and they are relying on a, a chemical reaction effectively to happen and harden, uh, not only do you need to make sure that they are really, really effectively mixed before you pour them, you also will run into the case that you will have to let it sit there. And if you're talking, if you're doing a deep pour, so now like an inch plus, uh, you're going to have to let that sit for several days before it's really completely hardened. UV or light reactive resin has actually become my go-to favorite recently. Now, there are uh, gaming brands you can buy of this, but you actually don't need to. You can get big, very large bottles of this quite cheaply online through outlets like Amazon or your local hobby uh, and craft store, because as I said, this is used to make paste or costume jewelry. And so, as a result, this you can buy very, very large bottles of this at quite a low price because it's meant to sort of make you know, big jewelry pieces and stuff like that. And you can also get the flashlight there relatively cheap, but any intense UV light will work, even and in including uh, the big giant one that sits in the, sun, the sky every day, the sun, uh, that will also cure this. So, these are really nice because it's uh, the liquid, as it were, in the UV resin is much less viscous, uh, so it, it sort of flows much more slowly. It's more gloopy, to make it as simple as possible. And because it's so much more gloopy, you can kind of shape it and fit it and squidge it around a lot easier. And then if you just let it settle a little bit before you hit it with a light, uh, it, will, it will then cure out completely flat still. Because you're hitting it with the light and, and you know really intensely and quickly drying it, it will cure quite quickly. Now, for the very deep pores, however, if you have a lot of space you're trying to do, like if you're doing a big diorama in water, you would not want to use this UV resin. Let's talk about tips and tricks for usage of this. All right, so tip number one, make sure you've effectively degassed the resin. This is usually the worst with uh, your two-part uh, epoxy because you have to mix them and then stir them, which will often bring more air and water, or sorry, air bubbles into the actual mixture. But it can happen with single part, it can happen with the UV resin, it can happen with all of it. Effectively, when you put this uh, pour in, you can have little bubbles of air that are trapped inside. Oftentimes they will degas on their own, they'll sort of float to the top and pop out of there but not always. And when they don't, then you get these little divots that are in there or weird bubbles that are trapped, and it does not look appropriate if you're trying to get nice clear water. Uh, so what can you do? You wanna make sure that whatever you're, if what you're using requires mixing, make sure it's very well and thoroughly mixed. And then you wanna do that nice pour, and then you can actually work and pop and work out the bubbles. So make sure it's flat. You can take a large sort of skewer or pokey stick uh, and, you know, basically like something you'd use to, to grill a shish kebab, uh, you know, a little wooden uh, bamboo stick, and you can kind of work those out. You can also very carefully use like a popsicle stick, work through the resin, and just kind of push the bubbles out and up and make sure that they are uh, all clean and clear and out of there. Um, there are other ways to degas, like there are actually professional tools to suck all of those out. Those are more than what we need to use for sort of professional level effects. There are degassing sort of um, uh, toolboxes and stuff you can put these things in that will do that. That's really sort of heavy duty and beyond what we generally would need to use. Tip number two. If you're doing a pour where there is some verticality to it, i.e. you're smashing against the edge of your base or the edge of a display plinth or something similar, then you'll want to make sure it is incredibly properly sealed. And there are layers to this based on how deep the pour you're doing is. So 
If you're doing a fairly shallow pour, a quarter inch or less, uh, then traditional blue painter's tape or something similar, tightly wrapped around the plinth, multiple layers. You want to do at least three layers of that painter's tape all the way around the surface. Uh, then, but tightly applied, at least three full layers, uh, that will generally contain any kind of leakage or spill in that event. If you go deeper than, say, an, than a half inch or more, you're going to want to buttress that tape. It's still good to start with the tape, but then you want to do something like put a piece of plastic card against the plinth and actually clamp it. So this is using like a traditional hardware clamp like you might use to uh, attach two pieces of wood that are glued together or something similar. You want to get a nice pressure-based clamp on that with the plastic. So you're going tape and then plastic and then the clamp holding that whole thing there. That way you don't get any leakage because there, it, nothing will ruin a water effect faster and your entire plinth than if you have leakage you can't see where it's run under the tape. You go to pull the tape off and you have all of this liquid that is now squidged out and dried and ruined your plinth and messed up your whole pour. Tip number three, mix inks and other things like that into your resin. That you can do this with any of the resins that I mentioned, so single part, two part, or the light curing. Um, and uh, you can mix in various highly transparent inks or glazes, or even contrast paints, speed paints, similar. Uh, you need less than you think. So that is my number one piece of advice. If you're going for blue tinted water, or sickly green pools, or muddy brown water, whatever it might be, okay? you only need a drop or two of the ink in quite a large amount of the resin to have an effect. And in fact, if you're just doing small little, a small little area on a base, you probably don't even want that. Take an old brush, get a tiny bit of that ink in it, and then swish it around in the resin. Uh, because you do not want to over, uh, like over uh, do the opacity and the color intensity of the water. In the end, certainly you can have like, uh, you know, Caribbean blue oceans and vile, gross, green Nurgle slime and all of those kinds of things, but they're still transparent to a degree. And it doesn't take more than a few drops to suddenly make your resin pour just be pouring that color of resin. Also, uh, make sure your ink is a transparent ink. So here, Primary color inks are going to do the best, so things that are solidly in their color. Don't try to buy the weird ones that are halfway between. They often have uh, mixed pigments in them, especially white, and that will mess up your whole resin pour very badly. Tip number four, let it cure. This is the hardest part, and I really can't impress this on you enough. I've done a lot of resin pours. I use these on a lot of my bases and display plinths, and you will get the urge to test. Is it dry? Is it dry? Is it dry? Let it be. At minimum, when you do a resin pour, you should let it sit for 48 hours. Base. That's to start. If you're doing a deep pour, add on another day or two. These things take a while to cure if you're using traditional single part or two part epoxies. Let those cure. Don't poke at them. Don't uh, mess with them, let them sit there, let them be smooth. Tip number five, when you're using the UV resin, one of the cool things you can do is work with the light to lower the, the, uh, the flow of the liquid even more. So it's already, as I said, quite gloopy and doesn't really flow very fast, but as you're moving it around, if you want to form it into some shapes or, or uh, have, say, cool waterfall effects where it's sort of running in rivulets, you can do that by simply applying a drop, turning on the UV light, hitting it for a few seconds, and then turning the light off. Turn it back on, pour again, and back and forth. By working back and forth, you cure it so quickly when it's in small amounts like that, you can actually create natural layers of the UV resin uh, and then shape it when it's when you've moved it to partially solid, but not completely there. 
It's a lot like working with green stuff that sat around for a little while, so it's more tacky and solid. Uh, in the same way, your, your UV light can help cure your UV resin just partially, so you can start having cool effects, or wave buildups, or droplets, or all of those sorts of neat things. Tip number seven, uh, multiple pores. What I mean by that is, after you've let it cure completely, you can keep adding more on top of it. It's not a problem. You can do that with all three of the resins. So if you need to build up, build more volume, or you get a concave, uh, if you get shrinkage, don't worry, just do multiple pours. It takes a long time, but you'll get a cool effect and you'll get the water, the flat, nice, even water you're after. Tip number eight, sanding and fixing. Sometimes you will have a problem where a little tiny leak happens or something like that, or you need to sand down some of your effects and or fix them because they get scratched or chipped, or you got impatient and poked at the water with your finger and now there's a fingerprint left in there, and what are you gonna do about it? Okay, well, the answer is simple and it's called gloss varnish. If for any reason your resin pour becomes scratchy or cloudy or messed up in general and you need to fix an error, you can simply apply a thick layer of gloss varnish over the top of your resin pour, let it flow into all of those cracks and crevices and recesses and imperfections, and then let it dry. When it dries, that thick gloss varnish will fill the space. It will re, uh, it'll make cloudy resin pours look quite clear and, and, and clean, and it will fix any imperfections in the surface and make them look good as new. Gloss varnish can be an absolute lifesaver when it comes to fixing a, a resin pour where something went wrong. All right, so there you go. That's everything for resin pours. Um, as you can see, I was working on a uh, display plinth through part of this video. So here is the final figure and uh, she's mounted now on this. Um, there's also other effects you can add on top, which I'll talk about here just a little bit as we, as we sort of close, which is there are all sorts of still water effects um, really, you can use any kind of gloss gel, which you can buy from your Amazon or your local craft store. There are also still water effects, but those tend to be priced up for the hobby. Those are just a heavy gloss gel medium. You can use those to build up waves, as you can see here, uh, and so, or, or ripples or anything like that. So if you have waterfall effect you're trying to do, um, gloss gel medium is going to be your go-to to add those ripples, waves, t t t uh, you know, any kind of like uneven effects if you don't want a completely flat pool, this is the way to do it. Um, you just build it up again over time. It will go on white, um, but then as it dries, it will become quite clear. Same rules apply to the gloss gel medium. You can mix in inks and colors to have uh, colored effects up into your, your, uh, your wave structures or something like that. Um, you can also paint them afterward. Uh, or you can also add in just a little bit of white or even some white pigment or even snow effects uh, to get little crashing waves. But that we'll explore more in a future video. There you go. I hope you enjoyed this. If you've got questions about water effects I didn't answer, drop them down in the comments below. I always answer every question asked on my videos. Hey, Give it a like if you liked it. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating. If you want to support the channel, there's a Patreon down below focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. We'd love to have you as part of the community. As always, thank you so much for watching this one. I really appreciate it, and we'll see you next time.